Coming to you from a portable microphone, this is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circuits department head, Dan Balser. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. First of all, thank you so much for continuing to indulge in this. It's free, but thank you so much for continuing to support uh, these conversations. Um, Without you on the other end, there'd be no point. I wonder how many of these I would have made if I knew no one was listening. I think for a while there was no one listening. (laughs) Keep making them. But thanks for listening. I appreciate that. Also, make sure you like the Facebook page, facebook.com slash DGMS podcast, where I will have links to all the things we're talking about. Make it easy for you. It's a one-stop shop. You can also, if you're in the mood and you're a fan, or if you just can tolerate this and are listening to a second episode, go on the iTunes store and leave a review. Evidently, those things matter. I'd appreciate that very much. So I'm back at... Uh, the library. I think it's been a couple of weeks since I recorded, and um, as is often the case, I'm sitting mere inches away from a, a person that I probably met like an hour ago, an hour ago, like who's kind of got this look on his face like, I'm game, I'm ready, let's do this, but what the hell have I gotten myself into? Just came out of a uh, really one of the best presentations ever. With all due respect to every speaker we've had, this was a uh, This was a professional presentation on top of having great content. Really entertaining, really, really good presenter in Chris Corley. Um, He's ECD at VML, and I know that there's a a likelihood that you saw those letters on your uh, the podcast file. I was wondering what VML was if you hadn't looked it up. Started off as a digital shop, has made its way pretty seamlessly into becoming a a, a very relevant, in fact, an ad age top ten relevant ad agency. It's not just a shop that can do digital, all that started off that way. I think back on the history of some of the successful places like RGA that started off doing digital and some motion graphics and segued into doing more traditional advertising. Um, What defines traditional advertising now is not what we would have used the word traditional to refer to it as 10 years ago. It's becoming much more integrated, much more digital, experiential. Uh, Chris talked about in the presentation about changing the word from target to audience, which I think is a really profound, um, seemingly insignificant, but profound uh, designation. And we could talk about that for a little bit. Um, Chris started off at uh, Darcy Macius Benton and Bowles, DMBNB, otherwise known as Darcy. Um, then he spent a very long time in his, in his, in his um, assessment, maybe four years too long, but it was almost 10 years at uh, Bernstein Rhine Advertising in Kansas City. And then he'd been at VML for about four years and started off as a writer. Is that right? Yes, copywriter from the beginning. There you go. And that's his voice. This voice is going to make me sound tinny and young, immature and clueless, because this is a voice that has been a professional voiceover, and you'll see what I mean in a second. Welcome. First of all, welcome to Atlanta. Welcome to the circus. Welcome to the microphone. Thank you very much. My mother always said I had a face for radio. You have a, you have a, face, so. for, you have a face for whatever you want to use that <laughs> face for. It's a, it's a pretty uh, pretty top-notch face, but the this voice... This is my first podcast, by the way. I'm really excited. Oh, that's cool. Really? Mm-hmm. With a voice like that, it's wasted. So the, we're bringing you to the world. So this is uh, an introducing... You know that? Don't you love that in a movie? It's like star's name, star's name, star's name, and introducing Chris Corley. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for being here. And um, I, I, there's so many things, so many different ways we can look at this. And I think that um, I want to talk, just jump off straight up. Okay. The career has been spent primarily in Kansas City. Has there ever been a time when you're like, I want to get out of here? Has there ever been an itch that came from you or came from someone else that was bothering you in any way that, that maybe you could, could could go somewhere else? Talk to me a little bit about um, your career in one city and your have the goals for your career goals changed throughout time? I have, this is a really interesting question. I have gone from resenting Kansas City to tolerating Kansas City to loving Kansas City and now to just celebrating Kansas City. That's great. And I think that it it mirrors the the city's renaissance. Mm. Um, it's always had a I say underrated um, advertising community. Uh, for the size of it, it supports some pretty big shops, and there's some pretty big uh, campaigns and some pretty good work that comes out of it. Um, but personally, yes, I. During a point, I, I wanted to get out of Kansas City. I was like, I need to go to Chicago. Hmm. I had an opportunity maybe in New York once. It scared my life, my wife to death. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. Um, and 
the dream was always I wanted to move to Chicago. Mm. And out of our por- portfolio night um, in college, I didn't get invited to meet with Leo Burnett or anything right. like that. So I'm like, I'm just going to give Kansas City a try and see what's going on. And this is back in the days where to, to get your book anywhere, you had to send it by mail. Right. I, I you remember saying, those days. Oh, yeah. And it, it there was a lot of effort that went into it. Yeah. And, and then it ended up on someone's floor and they never look at it. Right, in a giant pile. So um, when you say resented... The context of you're saying resenting, tolerating, and then you know accepting or celebrating, it's the ad community, right? You were, we're talking about not the actual living. In I'm talking or, about or the, the city. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> the city. The city has gone through so much, so many changes, and has so many more opportunities. And now being a father, like it's an amazing place to raise a family. Mm-hmm. And you know the the culinary community, the fashion community. The, you know, the celebrities like Jason Sudeikis and Paul Rudd and yeah. Eric Stone Street, they're all from there and they all come back and put on an event to support Children's Mercy Hospital. There are a lot of fun things going on in Kansas City. And uh, Sporting KC, too. I, I think I talk about MLS too much on this podcast. It comes, <laughs> it t- tends to come up. Uh, Tom Christman was on here. He's talked about Red Bulls. Um, <laughs> the uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting concept to me because I grew up in Atlanta and... Atlanta has always has permanently been the ad city of the future. I mean, it's been the ad city of the future mm-hmm. since the eighties. Right, it's, right. It's, it's never really reached that that level. Um, I did leave to go to New York. I, I don't think there was ever something that was being built uh, when I started my career in, in the early nineties. Um, do you do you think that there's a what do you think it takes? I should say to build something out of a place that is only merely tolerated. What 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 do you think helped it succeed and push forward? And one of the things you mentioned in your in your presentation for context for the listeners is you were talking about how this great work that you guys have done for Wendy's, which is jaw droppingly great. I mean, it, there's it's not object it's not subjectively good work. It's it's solid, really really good award winning. Thank work. you, thank you. With Kansas City production, Kansas City directors, Kansas City talent, it can't have always been that way. What, do you, what to what do you sort of attribute its its I don't even want to say renaissance. It's birth and it's it's flourishing. Boy, that's that's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of the guys who are running some pretty successful production companies are guys that I even came up in advertising with hmm. and are really forward thinking. Um, I think the production companies is a pretty young community right now in, in post-production and production. Hmm. And I just think that there's a draw to the city now. That's cool because of the the easy lifestyle mm-hmm. and all that it also has to offer. That's great. That's great. All right, let's change subjects. Let's shift around. Let's talk a little bit about um, values. I want to know what's important. I want to know what's important to you at this stage of your career, what personally, what's important to you as a as a ECD. Mm-hmm. What's important to I'll well, let's get to those first and then I'll, then I'll do the follow-up. So what 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 are the valuable things at this stage of your career as far as yourself personally and um, I think it's trying to become uh, the best leader I can be. Hmm. I think it's trying to become a good coach at this stage of my career. Are you, um, so that's uh, an active sort of, you're cognizant of that, aware of that? Oh, yeah. As day to day? Yeah, yeah. My wife is a, um, she is a, a, a coach of sorts for, for career. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's a, an LPC uh, counselor. And so what does that stand for? A uh, licensed professional counselor. Okay. And she's sort of, she's has a psychology master. So I probably should have been able to figure that out. Nah, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, but, but she helps me out a lot with like dealing with conflicts and helping people, coaching people, inspiring people, motivating people. Um, as you start um, ascending the ranks, you get close, you get farther away from the work, which a lot of people don't like. I'm, I'm kind of catching a second wind and I don't see myself, and I describe this to my team, I don't see myself as up here. I'm, I'm raising my hand up over my head. Yeah. I don't see myself as up here. I see myself as underneath them, pushing them up that's great. from the bottom mm-hmm. and giving them autonomy. I think that's really important and supporting them too, mm-hmm. obviously. Yeah, definitely supporting them. You know, I read this this great article um, it, that inspired me so much. Uh, it's the guy from Wyden, London. I forget, I forget his name. Forgive me if you're listening. But, um, you know, he, he was talking about that and, and it's taking none of the credit and all of the blame. Mm. And you really have to, you know, there's no, no gender non-specific way to say it. You need to man up, you know, that's the essence of it. Well, you and, also need to get your, out of your own ego. I mean, that's, a, I think that's. Oh a, yeah. Your ego is not your amigo, man. <laughs> your ego is not your amigo. That's uh like, 
I just saw a picture that five minutes ago, right before we started this online, of a it said taco emergency down nine Juan Juan. <laughs> Um, the ego, the ego, <laughs> I, ego, amigo. Right, your ego's not your amigo. So was that? I don't know you, so I'm not calling you out as having an ego. But was that an adjustment for you? I mean, was that something that you had to kind of segue into enabling rather than doing? Um, yes, I, I can get pretty um, hands on with something mm -hmm. and just move. I'll do it. You know, yeah. that's but not that's not good. No. And it's not good for me either. It's not, it, it, it just breeds more of that, you know? So my whole thing is the empowerment, uh, along with some freedom and accountability. Yeah. And accountability is something that gets lost. I yeah. mean, if, if there's stuff going on or, or someone's not performing or they're going to hear about it in, in a very professional, mm -hmm. respectful way, but I think otherwise they don't know what they're doing wrong. Cool. So who do you who do you answer to now? Who are you accountable to? I'm accountable to Mr. John Godsey <laughs> and um, Who's that? Mrs. Debbie Van Dieven. Uh, John Godsey. John... Here's what I tell. He's he's our executive creative director of the entire Kansas City office. Okay. I tell my team. I said, "There's me, and then there's God." Right. Z. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's awesome, and Debbie Van Dieven is our uh, global chief creative officer. Mm -hmm. She's Fantastic. And then uh, John Cook is our CEO. Then all the way up to Sir Martin Sorrell, right, WB, well. who's a real knight. A for reals knight. A real knight. A real yeah, knight. a real knight. A knighted man. Like Elton John. So what's, um, what is important to a new hire? So you've got a new team coming in, assuming you're interacting with junior teams. Um, what's the best way for them to endear themselves to you? What's important? What do you want to see out of... And you answered that a little bit in mm -hmm. the presentation, but for people who weren't in the room. Yeah, I want to hire... A junior team or a junior who wants to be a junior, who wants to work and wants to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I still consider myself a student of the, the industry. It's super important. And and it, you can't come in and be a brat and, and think you're Lee Clow and you demand this project and that project. Anyone, anything anyone asks you to do project-wise, it's like, yes, and what else can I do? Yeah. And show me that passion through the interview process. I've, I've interviewed so many... Uh, candidates, junior candidates who just were seemed disinterested or um, didn't show up or were, were late on the phone. And, I, you know, people in our position have a, a lot of stuff to do. And so we carve out this time for interviewing. And I'll tell you what, it's not our favorite thing in the world to do. Right. But if we make time for you, then, then show up and bring your A game. Right. I think it's interesting. I, I was thinking about this sense of um, that I've arrived. So someone's gone to college, they've gone maybe to, to an ad school and then the job is sort of like, you know, I want this and I want that. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get my head around why that, what makes that happen? What's the insight that creates the person who feels entitled to make, to have, to, to even consider that there's certain things I will or won't work on. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if this, if this misunderstanding, you, you hit the nail on the head that we never stop being clueless students ever. So, and I think it's because you go, you go to elementary school, then middle school, then high school, then college, and grad school, and it's boom, boom, boom. And I'm done. Now I get this. Right. It's like instead, you should be thinking like this is that's sort of the on ramp to just more of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a the mindset of naivete, stupidity, um, but also confidence in your own work, but like sort of like willingness to do whatever because you don't know what that's going to lead to that that could serve a lot of younger people well. Probably could have served me well early in my career, too. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, I'm part of what I consider the greatest generation, Gen X. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we we were the slacker generation. We weren't doing anything, but we didn't expect anything. Mm -hmm. We're like, hey, right. I don't feel like doing that, so I'm just not going to do it. Right. I'm just not going to do anything. Right. Uh, and then you read a lot about, and I'm not coming down on millennials. I think they're beautiful creatures. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love them. Uh, but they, they, uh, there is, there is a sense of entitlement that I see a lot more than, than I, I, I ever have. And, and I've seen it in friends working other industries too. Now I just don't, I don't know if that's just, we're like the grumpy old men who are like, these kids want everything and we forgot how we were. This has come up a few times. I think that they want to be told what to do. And I think that that's, uh, because their parents have told them they're great and told them what they need to do to be great, I think that they're expecting to be told what to do to be great and then enable. Because there's no mm -hmm. lack of talent, intelligence, uh, creativity, 
um, work sense at, of humor. There's no lack. There's no lack of any of the good stuff. The good stuff is all in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't think of it as uh, as entitlement. I think of the the definition of entitlement. And I've said this on the show, so I apologize to the listeners who heard me say this. I think that that just means they're entitled to understand the context of this whole situation. Like, tell me what's happening and what I'm supposed to be doing here and why. And that's kind of off putting to someone who never thought to ask those things when we were young. It's like, right. who the fuck are you to ask me why you should be doing that? Right. But if you need to know why, here's the situation. And then you've basically lit a fire. I think that, that that's that's a great thing. Because I, 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 just between you and me, like I spend every day in rooms with millennials trying mm-hmm. to figure out how to rig this well to get at that good stuff. And there's so much good stuff there. It mm-hmm. just takes a slightly different way of looking at it. Anyway, whatever. Um, comments on that? I got to, no, I, 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 I totally agree with you. And I can't imagine doing what you do and, and being in those rooms constantly and, and seeing this because there's this herd of culture that comes through in every generation, right? right? It, this is the hardest thing. And, and I'll tell you that the weirdest thing for me, and I'm going to tell you if you're a millennial listening, everybody in my generation and even 10 years younger than me assumes that if there's a goal for you to run to, you're going to fucking run there. Mm-hmm. Don't think that they do. I don't think that they do the same way. They still want to be told, okay, now wait a second. So the way to get there is to go, how oh, again? Like, what's the, and they're going to do it, but I think that they, because my thing is, I kind of think we set up this, just like you do at an agency, we set up the structure for you to mm-hmm. succeed. Yeah. The structure is here. So why aren't you inventing and creating and making and failing? That's another big thing. I don't think that, I think that there's sort of like, you said something too. You said you had some Instagram that was that sucks. <laughs> Shouldn't we all have an Instagram that sucks? Right, because I'm trying something different, and you know, it's like that's what I say with with everything. That's a great example. If you, at least I tried something. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it it fell in its face, and and I have a great understanding with our client that old that old widen adage, fail harder. Right. Is is let's let's get out there. Let's not be afraid of this. Right. And it takes some of the pressure off too. It, it's liberating because you approach everything as a work in progress, as an experiment. Um, what is it about you? What personal trait of yours do you think has served you well to your career? What has gotten you to, to where you are? Oh, first, I definitely my faith. Definitely my faith. I'm a Catholic, cradle Catholic, still Catholic. Um, Interesting. And, there's two kinds of Catholics, right? Yeah. There's the Catholics and there's the atheist Catholics. Right, exactly. <laughs> no, I, I am. And, and I... I feel like I have a, a, a good prayer life. Um, what does that do for you? What does it provide for you? Oh, confidence. Confidence and inspiration. And, you know, there's a story about, and I usually end, because I'm, I'm not afraid to talk about my faith. I know that some people think it's taboo, um, but I think it's it's just part of me. So Yeah. I, I, no. There's this. Um, I respect that. There's this uh, story about George Washington Carver, who prayed to God about different ways to use the peanut. And he came up with like a hundred different ways. And he, mm-hmm. he attributes the prayer to that. Now, whether you believe it's divine intervention like I do, or it's just a form of meditation, mm-hmm. I think it's it's important just to be there with yourself and be there or or with, with God and, and ask him for things and say, help me out with this one. And there's actually also a patron saint of advertising, St. Bernardine of Siena. Really? Who, uh, who we're starting to... Uh, Kind of talk about it on our team a little bit as as our guy when we're in it's cool when we're in tough places. But yeah, my faith has been has been really instrumental in in, in my whole life. And I think that's really I think that's really interesting. I, I think that uh, it's something people should talk about. I think that I talk about you know the importance of psychotherapy, the importance of meditation, oh, yeah. yoga, yeah. faith, whatever it is. Um, you know, we have to do so much alone. Mm-hmm. We don't have to necessarily suffer alone. You know what I mean? And I think right. it's important to uh, to find whatever partner in your life it is, psychological, emotional partner, I think mm-hmm. it's important. Yeah. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No, neither do I. And I think also we are always, and I'm so, so guilty of this, always so keyed up on coffee and caffeine and mm-hmm. I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. And you're doing a million things at once. You need to take that, take that, you know, half hour or something that, Breathe. Breathe. And there's this great um, quote, and I forget, I think St. Francis said it. it was, um, you should pray 15 minutes a day 
unless you're really busy, then you pray 30. There you go. That's great. So, that's great. And, and apply that to your meditation or your workout that's routine great. or your yoga or, or whatever. Yeah, that's great. So, all right, but I would contend that's not a trait. Oh, my faith? Yeah. Uh, maybe not. Okay, so let's... Uh, maybe it is. What trait do you think? What do you think it is? For you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think... Yeah, I, from what I've seen, I think that there's a clarity and a comfort and in, 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 in belief in your own sort of... I don't know. There's something in the moment when you're presenting that that, that binds people to you, your word. Mm. And I think that there's a it's 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 a charisma that I think should not be underrated or held as a negative connotation. I, don't, I think charisma can be a very very destructive thing, but I think if if, if applied with intelligence and, and I know, I know where you're going here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah. uh, I think I, I don't know you well enough to say, but I'd say that that's probably helped. I, do you think there's value to that? You think you think you were invited to meet client meetings at a younger age? Then, yes. Okay, there you go. And I think that that, that helped. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I told you before, I came from a theater background. I mm -hmm. did musicals in in high school and and in, and in college. So I like to be up and presenting. I did so much presenting um, to McDonald's franchisees when I worked uh, at Bernstein Rain, and and it was such great practice. We put on a show, we went on a road show at all these different co-ops and. I do like 30 minutes and of the same presentation over and over and over. And I mean, I, but I've always been the kid. Like I was the kid like doing Bono microphone poses in the mirror as a kid, mm -hmm. you know, just wanting to, I, I, if I could do anything, I'd love to be a rock star. But, oh, you yeah. know, I think advertising is as close as I'm going to get. You can play the video game. I mean, it kind of feels oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting to segue into like what you were saying about target audience being an audience. Um, I just said target audience. <laughs> target audience. Target versus audience. Um, which I think is a really cool thought. So explain it again to the listeners that weren't there that what, what what you mean by the evolution of just the term target to audience. Can you summarize yeah. that real quick? Well, if there were if you look back at advertising, you want to talk about the three models during the Don Draper days. It was the war model, mm -hmm. which was all about you know power and efficacy and and almost going to battle against the consumer mm -hmm. and calling them a target, right. literally, yeah, literally, which just doesn't seem very friendly to me. Right. And then, you know, then came the science model where you're using numbers and measurements to predict where uh, the consumer will be. Very media driven. Very media driven. Mm -hmm. And but you're, you're still calling them a target, but you're treating them like a lab rat mm -hmm. being led through this maze. I think treating them like a wallet, but OK. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's like starting off there from a brief, calling the people that you are trying to build a bond with a target. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's, you know, back then. It just wasn't as important to ingratiate yourself or to right. have a relationship. It's like, sure, we got buy it, dummy, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And now moving into, which I think is the best way now that consumers are so savvy, you have to make a deeper connection with them. Mm -hmm. And that's where storytelling comes in. And that we don't call them a target. You know, we call them an audience. Right. And, you, and the visual you showed for that was a, like a live music performance. The mm -hmm. audience is, is connected to the live. And I think that's critical from the creative's perspective because more than ever we have to entertain. Yes. We have to entertain. We can't tell us we can't tell a product story. We have to tell a human story, right? Very very important. Mhm. Mm um so this is a question that I've asked every guest and uh I kind of like when I have a newbie on the on the show cuz you've never you have no idea oh, where this is no. going. So um knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time to 1999, graduating from University of Kansas, what would you whisper in young Chris's ear? What would you say to yourself knowing what you know now? What do you wish you'd known? Don't be afraid. It's all going to, it's all going to work out. Were you afraid? Oh yeah. I'm still afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still afraid. I, I, you know, I, I was first laid off at Darcy mm -hmm. when Darcy closed after 9-11 and I didn't think I was going to work again. Mm. And that whole summer, my wife and I are living in a condo, and I'm just worried that I'm never going to have a job again. Um, and so I'm not enjoying all this great time I had over the summer that I could have done. And I did some great stuff. I read The Fountainhead, which was a lifelong dream. And, you know, I, <laughs> see how big I dream. Uh, no, no, but, no, I, I know what you're saying. I remember I had a layoff at some stage where I I stayed by the phone or emails constantly. Yeah. and I never really just, like, enjoyed the fact that... And, and it, you didn't have faith that like you're going to work again. Like that's, that's the fear, right? That, that like, 
I've been written out of this business. I've been the business has decided that it's not for me, and that's mm-hmm. just so wrong, right? Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree that I agree with that, and I think part of not being afraid too is, hey, don't be afraid to move to Chicago without a job mm-hmm. and look for one. You know, I, I, in a way, I, I was really afraid of that. Don't be afraid. Um, of doing that because you're afraid you'll lose your girlfriend and she'll be in Kansas City and who's my wife now. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we did have a long distance relationship. I went to St. Louis and she was in Kansas City and we did uh, a long distance thing and it all worked out great. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just think that, and getting back to my faith, I think definitely God's going to put you where he wants you no matter what. So you got to look for the You're going to be where you should be. You're going to be where you should be. I mean, I, I just met you today, but you are so great here. I mean, these kids love you. Uh, I and... haven't met them yet. So, but I want to say I want I haven't met those ones yet. I do want to say something interesting. I do want to say something that I don't know. If I want to say something interesting. You said you're still scared, mm. and it's so it's so fascinating to me. I was sitting in my office earlier, and I overheard three grad quarter um, art directors talking about their um, and a writer were talking about their parents. Uh, meeting someone and sending them a link, you know, a link or an email from someone that they met that's in advertising at some agency no one's heard of, and they're on the financial side or whatever, it's like, mm-hmm. just to help them get a job. And I said to them, I said, by the way, I walked out of my office. I said, by the way, I just want you to know that like this is how it's going to be for you for the rest of your career. Your parents are never going to know what you do. They're mm-hmm. always going to suggest that you call this person that they met somewhere because uh-huh. they they love you and trying to help you. Yeah. But that's not going to go away. The 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 stress that you're feeling in school right now because you're under deadline. That doesn't go away. Mm. Um, in fact, when it's, it's compounded with children because you make life decisions to add to this. So the feeling of fear, the feeling of anxiety, the feeling of stress, the feeling of having a clueless family that doesn't support you, which is untrue. They support yeah, you yeah. their way, is permanent. So you have to realize this is the terrain. Whoever promised you that things were going to be perfect was not – that never happened. No. So get used to the discomfort. Embrace it somehow. Pray, meditate, whatever it takes. Don't don't you think that 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 you could have told yourself that, and it would have been like, oh, that'd be nice. Yeah, that you tell me how to do that. That'd be great. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. That yeah. There's so much into that, and, yeah. and and as you said, it just kind of stays with you. And there's a way to judo that too, like to take your fear and, and leverage oh, yeah. leverage that into a concept, leverage that into an empathy or a, a curiosity mm-hmm. um, to. Whatever mechanism you use to to come to terms with it could be a great tool for creating, you know, I think. And just realizing that everyone feels the same way. In some way. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is, is scared of, of one thing or another. It's it's how we get through that and, and how we, we conquer it. And, you know, one, one of my philosophies is, uh, and, you know, this is like a little trinket philosophy, but nothing too bad or too good lasts for too long. Mm-hmm. And when things are really good, that's when I really start getting afraid. Oh, really? When things are bad, I'm like, okay, it's going to turn around. Things are going to turn around. But when things are really good, like we, we went on that run with Wendy's, man. We went on that run and and got one lines at can and, and we're getting written up and everything, high-fiving and, and all that stuff. And I was telling my team, enjoy this. Just enjoy it. Savor it. So before before I let you go, what what are you excited about? What Get you jumping out of bed in the morning to go in. What's the next thing that you guys are uh, fired up about over at VML? Uh, I think right now um, we're doing um, for Wendy's a lot of out of scope work that um, we're just coming up with awesome ideas, just on our own volition with our own briefs, uh, solving for pain, solving pain points, mm-hmm. and turning them into we're inventing we're we're uh, coming up with with bigger ideas outside of just what we're scoped for and we're presenting them to them great. and they're really receptive and and it's been great it's kind of like you know i said i set it up i said one of the reasons we're doing this is because to freshen things up spice things up you know we've been in a relationship for almost four years now mm-hmm. and we don't want this to get stale we want to try new things great. in bed you know <laughs> that's great. no that's really that's really great it's just been a pleasure meeting you thank you so much for oh yeah this. man this was my first podcast ever and i i think this was great i think it was all right it turned out. <laughs> listeners let me know leave a comment uh send me an email to uh, dan's podcast at mac.com um, leave a comment on the iTunes store. You can also leave comments on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash DGMS podcast. Um, you can follow Chris on the Twitter 
and I know I said the word the. It's the Twitters. Of, yeah, it's the Twitter. Um, it's he's at um, call me Corley. C a l l m e c o r l e y at call me Corley. Um, VML is on the internet too. Very slick website. Check that out. VML.com. Yes, I did all of it. No, Good just, work, just, my friend. You can, just kidding. Jack, <laughs> jack of many traits. And listeners, we'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you so much for listening. Chris, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. A lot of fun. Lot see, of fun. You ne- see you next time. Bye. That's great. Oh, good. That's fun. Okay. Dude, you do a good job. I lost myself again there a little. No, you're good. You do a really good job of this. I think you've been doing it a lot. 10,000 hours.